Welcome everyone to the Asian Voices Radio Podcast, where you'll find real Asian American conversations, including all the topics you were too afraid to ask your Asian parents. I'm your host today, Sheena Yap Chan. Our special guest is Connie Chung, a published author and speaker who has three graduate degrees from Harvard in prevention science, human development, and psychology, and her doctorate of education in human development and psychology. She's a big advocate for homeless youth, especially in helping those with mental health issues, abuse, and trafficking. Welcome, Connie. Thank you for joining us on the Asian Voices Radio. Thanks for having me. Would you mind sharing with our audience about what you do? Yeah, so I am a survivor of child and youth homelessness myself, and um, my late father was homeless. Uh, He lived in a cave. It's a long story. And then... I became an advocate for youth homelessness. Uh, I was a researcher um, on child and youth homelessness, as well as domestic violence and um, sexual assault in homeless teenagers. And then I worked for Missy, a organization for CSEC, which is commercially sexually exploited children. And I was working with the transitional age youth um, who had been sexually trafficked in the Bay Area. And I had some previous experiences where I was um, working with AIDS orphans and Maasai tribal, tribal women in, um, in uh, Tanzania. And I did some work with AIDS orphans in Kenya too. And that was a brief time, but I did do that. And then I did some federal policy work Um, consulting on housing projects for um, homeless veterans, um, usually with mental health issues after uh, experiencing um, PTSD and homelessness. And then, and then now I, um, I stay at home with my two children, an infant and a toddler. My toddler is on the autism spectrum. And, um, I also volunteer with the prison ministry. Wow. Um, You know, I'd like to start actually with asking, you know, what was it like growing up? Because you mentioned you were homeless. Your father was homeless. Um, He he was living in a cave. I mean, what was that like uh, living in in the United States as a home, like, you know, as a homeless kid? So my parents, it's, it's a very confusing story. And I actually don't know all the facts myself because they are very private people and, um, but I know that they, they're from North Korea and then I'll just say like a lot happened mm-hmm. to them that was pretty traumatic and it kind of, um, snowballed into my life, even though I'm the only one not born in North Korea. I mean, I'm the only one born in the U S I mean, among the children. And so, um, my dad did live in a cave with his family and then he, um, watched, I think two of his siblings die of starvation. Um, And then uh, he died in 2016. When he died, he was um, paralyzed from a massive stroke. And he didn't tell me much about himself. I think think it was quite painful for him. But it definitely showed in how he parented. Um, He wasn't... um, He wasn't always the most, like, uh, mentally stable person sometimes. And I think he had a lot of unworked trauma. And long story short, um, that was also true for my mother. And I ended up living off and on on the streets of L.A. I think my first episode was age 12. And then my last episode of homelessness was 18 or 19. And... um, there were a lot of brief multiple episodes. And then what happened was it's hard to know for how long or how frequently I was homeless because, uh, it would, I know my longest stretch of homelessness lasted three to four months where it was continuous, but there were many bouts in between. That's how I got involved with the covenant house because, um, when I was a youth, 
I ended up at the Covenant House. And then sometime after I left, I wrote them an email and say, said, you know, I know you probably don't remember me, but you guys made a total difference in my life. And um, I'm now at Harvard and I used to live in your shelter. And they wrote me back immediately. And so that's how I started advocating for them. And in terms of my experience of homelessness versus my dad's, it, it's very different because, you know, he was under a brutal regime and then he went to South Korea and then I think he went to Latin America. It's very confusing, but I lived in LA and that was um, not nearly as bad in terms of hunger, but the threat of sexual and physical violence was always real for me, being a, a pretty petite young Asian female. Yeah. Wow. I mean, the the story that you just shared is, is you know, um, it's it's crazy, right? Like, you know, things like these do happen. And it's unfortunate that, you know, sometimes our older generation never want to talk about the traumas they go through. But I think that is really important to talk about, right? So we can heal together, right? Um, you know, I was just talking earlier about intergenerational trauma and how, you know, we carry the traumas of our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents. And if we don't unlock that, you know, we're going to go through the same cycle. And so, like you mentioned, your dad never want to talk about it. And I, I understand why, right? Going, I'm pretty sure going through that was was probably not the best, right? It was probably really bad. And we will never know what he went through because we were not in that situation. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I love that you mentioned, you know, the Covenant House helped you, you know, be the person that you are today. You even went to Harvard, which is great, right? Sometimes we feel like we feel like that our circumstances define us, but it didn't define you. You said you were going to, you know, you were going to turn your life around and you ended up going to Harvard, which is great. And it just shows as Asian women, you know, we can go out there and make things happen if we choose to. And, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, when you were homeless at that time, you know, as Asian women, we always become an easier target because of the negative stereotypes we go through, right? Oh, she's quiet. She's submissive. She's just going to do what I tell her to do. And so it just makes it you know, it, it makes us an easier target, unfortunately, right? Um, but I'd love to know, like you mentioned that you did a lot of work for the Covenant House. You also helped a lot of sex trafficking victims. You know, how did how did you start that workout? So, yeah. So when I sent them the email, I did not expect much of a response. I didn't know because, you know, they, they service so many homeless youth in many locations. But uh, what happened was I had randomly passed it. Um, when I was visiting LA and I ra randomly passed the shelter and I was like, wait, I, I, I didn't even intend to go there. Um, and then I like a flood of memories hit me. And then I was, I think I was visiting my parents at the time. And then I came, went back to Boston. I was like, I'm going to send them an email, make, you know, and surprisingly they forwarded it to the executive, the then executive director, George Lozano. And I did not expect that. And now um, the new executive director is Bill Bedrosian. But um, he just responded and say, Connie, you know, um, uh, you know, we, we love to hear stories like yours. Would you? And surprisingly, he asked me to be that year's um, speaker. And I was like, what? And he was just like, would you like to speak at our gala? And I was like, um, I did not you know, see that coming. And I said, oh, okay, but I really didn't know what I was in for. And then that kind of um, went into other speaking events. Like I spoke at um, the Lincoln Center and, um, you know, like with other pretty high profile speakers that for the charity, like um, at the time it was John Bon Jovi and uh, it was Martin Scorsese. And then and, and I was one of those speakers and I was just really floored because I did not, I don't really see myself in, you know, their, their spectacular superstar category, but I, I do have the lived experience. And, um, and then with Missy, um, I felt like, you know, I'm, a am a, I'm a Christian, but my politics are, to be honest, uh, fairly left-leaning. And so, but I, I had the sense that I should help sex trafficking victims because I had seen a lot of really bad stuff when I was homeless, really bad stuff. I had a, um, a very vivid memory of maybe I was 14 or 15. I remember um, a pimp trying to abduct me 
and I was running and running and I hid in an alleyway and it was awful. And, um, and other girls were not, and unboys were not so lucky. And so I had this sense that I should do something. And then I don't know why I was praying and I, I saw this ad for Missy that, and, um, they, they work with, they were founded by formerly trafficked, uh, women. And so it was survivor led. And then I just, I wrote them and then I got, I, I got hired and that was an eye opening experience. Um, it was hard. Um, and my last year there, I was very pregnant at almost at 40 years old, at 40 years old, I was pregnant with Isabella and I was like going on these crazy raids and involved with the DA office and, you know, and then Missy would say, Hey, so-and-so is, is in a motel. We think she's been trafficked there. Can you go there? And I was like pregnant and 40 years old (laughs) and I'd be waddling and I'd be like, okay, but the cops are nearby, right? We're, I'm okay. Right. The baby's okay. Me, I'm okay. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cops are going to be nearby. Don't worry. You're fine. And so I would go in there into these crazy situations and literally find this girl who been drugged and kidnapped or whatever her story was. Not, not whatever. I mean, there were different stories. I don't mean to minimize the story, but it would be some crazy emergency traumatic situation for everyone involved and very dangerous for me. And, and then, um, but I would get her out and then we would get her involved with the DA if, if she want, and, uh, you know, other services to get her some counseling and that's kind of what I did for two and a half years. And then my last year I was pregnant. Yeah. And then uh, now, you know, I'm, I'm interested in special needs ministry because um, the past year was pretty intense. I had another baby. You might have heard her crying in the background. Sorry. My husband's doing the best he can to watch her. And, um, <laughs> and my kid who my older kid, Isabella, who turned four last week, um, we found out she has autism um, last fall. And, um, we didn't really know before because now I know more about autism that girls can mask certain symptoms. And so I have, I'm starting to think about special needs issues and special needs ministries. And, but I really want to also become a prison chaplain. So yeah, that's kind of where that happened with that one. I really think your story should be turned into a movie. I mean, you have such a fascinating story. I mean, going into raids while you're like almost ready to pop out a baby. I mean, I was like, why is this not a movie yet? <laughs> you know, I mean, you, I mean, like your whole story is just very interesting, right? And it's, it, and there's a reason why all these big charity ga- galas, you know, asked you to speak because you do have a phenomenal story. You went from a homeless kid to to going to Harvard, that's that's not typical, right? So of course your story is powerful. And I know sometimes we're like, well, why, why would they pick me, right? Bon Jovi's right beside me. It's like, because your story is powerful and you need to own that. And you have to realize like, you're gonna help someone out there in a similar situation, realize their potential. You know, they see like, oh my God, Connie was homeless, but she made it to Harvard. If she can do it, I can do it. And this is why like stories like these are so powerful, right? You never know whose life you're gonna change. And um, you know, it's, Thank it's, you. it's, it's, you know, sometimes we, we think our story doesn't matter, but our story does matter. And like a story like theirs, like I mentioned, it should be like a movie or a TV show or, or a K-drama, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'll see it on a K-drama one time. Be like, that's Connie's story. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I know you mentioned you wanted to get into like, um, you know, special needs because of what happened with your daughter. And you also wanted to be a prison chaplain. Uh, you know, maybe would you be able to share with the audience what a prison chaplain is and what they do? Yeah, so um, you know, I I started getting involved with this prison ministry two and a half years ago is when I started. Now, granted, they were on hiatus for a while during COVID, you know, because like prisons are like are, are have a real issue with COVID contamination, and so. But I started meeting up with them two and a half years ago, and then um, a chaplain they can offer there are different kinds there are some that are are not specifically religious they're they're like humanist chaplains and then there are some that are openly spiritual or buddhist or catholic or jewish or muslim and then they and and others are are um christian and so 
I think you provide um, spiritual support um, to people, and it could be in different specializations. It could be in the military. There are military chaplains. There are hospice chaplains, like people who are going to die, and um, there are um, chaplains in hospitals. Um, maybe they they have cancer or something. And then I was think thinking about prison chaplaincy, and it's it's funny how I got interested in it. It kind of been hibernating in me a long time because one of the people that got me that and I don't want to push my or I don't want to push my religion down other people's throats and I can understand and appreciate that religion has often been used to like to oppress others unjustly it can be used as a platform about homophobia transphobia sexism slavery all kinds of stuff and so I don't want the audience to feel like, you know, my beliefs are, are, should be their beliefs. But I became a Christian. Um, uh, it's a complicated story. It wasn't like an overnight thing, but I did meet a chaplain when I was homeless. Now she wasn't a, a prison chaplain. It was in the shelter. And then I also met an illiterate woman at the shelter. She was illiterate because she had to she couldn't go to school. She had to support her family in Mexico. So she started working as a kid, literally. And she never learned to read, but she was very devout. And she asked me to read the Bible to her. She was ashamed that she couldn't read. And she admitted that she never went to school because she had to support her family in Mexico. Would I read the Bible to her? And then I said, sure, I can't read Spanish though. Is that an issue? And she goes, no, I can, I can understand some English now. And so I started reading the Bible to her, not being a believer myself. And then I met that chaplain and that chaplain was very, very compassionate and very, very accepting. And she ministered to a lot of people who were homeless. Now, homeless people, LGBTQ youth, in fact, many of them are thrown out or run away because of their sexual or gender identity. And so um, she was very loving and even though we didn't have much contact for a long time, I never forgot her. And so I never forgot how I felt around her. That's the better. And then that made me think, oh, there's something to it. And also, you know, I, um, I narrowly went to prison myself. Uh, and I'm not just saying this. Um, when, when that happened, that situation happened, um, I did not know about the crime. Uh, I was... <laughs> I was a homeless youth and I did not know about the crime and I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. I narrowly escaped in prison myself and I saw like a lot of injustice, whether that was police brutality against the homeless, particularly against people of color, as well as I had some officers who were very kind to me. And so then, um, and a lot of people who were homeless intentionally try to go to prison because at least they're getting a meal, um, they're getting a bed, and so there's a lot of connections between homelessness and imprisonment. And then I used to um, visit my brother in juvenile hall. And that wasn't, that wasn't a prison or a jail. But when I would visit him, um, he had a lot of issues with drug use. I think we all reacted to our traumas differently. Um, that kind of like keyed me in that. And there was actually verses in the Bible when I was in prison and naked and hungry, where were you? And so we have, I feel, lost our soul about caring for those who are not in the best positions. And some, and a lot of prisoners are there for dr nonviolent drug offenses. So there needs to be some kind of spiritual work and emotional work, no matter what you've done. And you don't know their life story that precipitated what they did. I'm not excusing crime. So that's kind of where that came from. Thank you so much for sharing all that. And, you know, I also believe like we need to heal, you know, our, our youth. Right. Um, there was this there was a tweet that I saw that um, in Honolulu, like their girls juvenile system was has been empty for months because they were not, you know, they were doing things differently. Right. They were having them through this whole healing journey, you know, really help them, you know, overcome their traumas and stuff. And since then, it's been empty for for months. And so it, it, it is proven that it can work, right? When we can help 
um, the younger generation with what they're going through. So um, what you mentioned, you know, really does make a lot of sense. And it's definitely needed, especially now in this crazy world that we're in. So many things are happening. So many things are going on. And, um, you know, the more we can work on ourselves, talk about uh, mental health or traumas, uh, I believe it'll be a better world. So I heard that you graduated with two masters and one doctorate. What what led you to do, you know, to, to go through that path? You know, my parents were, especially my dad, my late dad was really into education through college. Okay. Then they were very demanding until college. But after that, they really just wanted me to get married and have kids and take care of them. And so they didn't really think like going much farther in graduate school was, was good. And so um, what happened was, this is a really weird story. I was going through a really deep depression because life was awful at the time. I'll put it that way. It was awful. Um, trigger warning, I was I was kind of suicidal. What ended up happening was I was like, well, if I'm going to die, I want to travel before I, I kill myself. And so I Googled flights to the East Coast and I'd never been to the East Coast. And then I found out that Harvard had this weekend for um, students of color, and I guess, uh, and uh, they would host you for free uh, for lodging and, and some of the food um, if you could fly there for their, um, for their orientation and to learn more about their academic programs. And I know it sounds awful, but at the time in my very depressed, <laughs> bizarre mind, I the flight was so cheap. I think it was like the universe or God or telling me to go because it was so cheap and I'm about to kill myself and I'm going to take this flight. And I said, and then Harvard will give me a place to stay and food and then I'll just leave <laughs> and then go kill myself. And I, I, I really did that. So I go over there. And I don't have any intention of applying, right? Everyone else on the tour, like asking me serious questions, trying to impress the staff and the faculty. And I'm like, da, da, da. and I finally, finally, like some guy on the tour was like, so what program are you applying to? And, you know, do you need help with your essay? And, and what, what do you need? Like, and I was like pretty transparent with him. I said, um, I actually have no desire to apply and he was like, what? Then why are you here? And I'm like, well, they get food and lodging and, you know, it's a rich university. And I'm just here to do that because I can't pay for the flight, food and hotel. And he was so angry and offended. He's like, you know, you just took a spot from another person of color who really wants to be here. And this is what you do with it. Now, I didn't tell him I was suicidal and kind of not in my right mind. But then I said, I felt so bad after being called out like that, and it's true, that I decided to apply not thinking I'd get in, just so that I wouldn't feel like a horrible person for doing that. And I got in. I was like, what? <laughs> what? I just used them. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. So I get in for the first master's degree, and I was just like, what? what? How, the, how did I get in? So then I go... And then during my master, first master's degree, uh, a professor said, you know, you're a really good writer. Why don't you apply to the doctorate? You know, I really like the way you write. And then I was like, apply to the doctorate? He goes, yeah, just think about it, you know, maybe. So I think, no, I'm not going to get into the doctorate because it's, it's much harder uh, in terms of the acceptance rate. I was like, Ugh. but I was like, well, maybe, you know, maybe I can do it. So um, I applied to the doctorate and got in. And really, it was really his encouragement that I like the way you write, just think about it. And then during that doctorate, um, I, you know how you have coursework requirements for a certain number of years, and then you do, you know, the other steps, like your quals, and you do your dissertation or, or whatever. But during that coursework, I like unintentionally earned a second master's degree, because I guess... I did the breath requirements for another master degree, and then the the um, office of the registrar told me, "Hey, you know your coursework, it like actually qualifies for a second master degree. Do you want to just you know make that official?" And I said, "Yeah, well, if that works out, you know, <laughs> like I'll just yeah, I can do that, you know." So that's how I got my second master degree was during 
it was not like me trying to get a second master's degree. And then I got the second master's degree in passing because the coursework I did before um, the dissertation qualified. And that's how I got the second master's degree. And then I got the doctorate. And the doctorate was a nightmare because a lot happened then. Um, my dad had a massive stroke and um, became permanently disabled. He became paralyzed. I took care of him. I left Harvard for a while to take care of him. Then I went back and graduated. Yeah, so that's kind of where that happened. So I am not this like this prototype, you know, stereotype Asian kid who's like her parents, you know, if you don't get into Stanford or Harvard, you know, you're not my kid or you have to be a doctor or anything else. And no, I mean, they were very demanding until I got into college. And then I did fine in college. I graduated as class commencement speaker of my department at UC Berkeley. And then after they didn't really have, in fact, my parents actively tried to stop me from going to Harvard because um, they thought it like being overeducated at my age would hinder my marriage and kids. And there was some truth to that because I started the game really late, right? I had my first baby at 40 and I had my second baby weeks before I turned 44. So that's how I got, so that's how I got my degrees. That's that's awesome. And I love that you just went for it, right? I mean, you weren't really expecting anything. You kind of just took action and just let the universe decide what would happen. And it's just crazy when you just go out there and make just try, right? I mean, if you got it, great. Of course, great. If you did it, it wasn't the end of the world and you just move forward, right? Yeah. I know sometimes it's not always easy to go out there and try something different or apply for this or apply for that because we get so um, pressured with the outcome already. We're going to think, oh, we're going to get rejected. They're not going to take us in. But, you know, you, you'd be surprised at yourself when you just go out there and just take action and make things happen, right? Like what you did, you know, you got in, then you got, you got the doctorate because someone mentioned, you know, you're a good writer. And sometimes we don't see that because we have a lot of blind spots, right? And that's why it's important to have you know, to surround yourself with people around you who could see those blind spots and see, you know, the magic in you that sometimes we can't see in ourselves. Right. Um, and so, you know, for me, like you don't look, you look very young. So <laughs> when you said you had your first baby at 40, I'm like, oh my gosh. Right. That's, it's crazy. But, um, I know you have a, a, a story, um, with your second baby, because one thing is you were, you were giving birth in a wheelchair. I mean, uh, would you be able to share a little bit about that? Yeah. So when I was very pregnant, a little past a year, but almost exactly. It was June of 2021. I uh, got into a pretty bad accident. I fell. I did not tumble. And um, then it, it was pretty severe. I, 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 I uh, broke three bones and I tore off all of the tendon and ligament from my ankle. And I was very pregnant. Um, they think that I fell because I had vertigo related to a pretty bad ear infection. I was actually, and um, I'm actually born hearing impaired and my mother was deaf until her recent cochlear implant. And so ear infections because of my anatomy can get very, very bad. And then your ears affect your sense of balance. And so they think I fell from the vertigo as well as like maybe issues with um, my pregnancy. And so then I went to the ER and they told, and I consulted with maybe five orthopedic surgeons. And one of them said, you don't need the surgery. But the other four or five said, if you don't have surgery, you will never walk again. There's no way you will walk again. And then they said, but, um, you know, if you don't have surgery, if you have surgery, just letting you know, um, you, you, the baby inside you could die. And it was a really crazy time because I had gone through so much to have the second baby. Although I got pregnant very easily after marriage, I got married pretty late in life uh, with Isabella. I had a much harder time having a second child um, at my age. Um, I kept getting pregnant before Layla and losing the pregnancies. So I have a history of miscarriage in between and that that's another very painful story. And so they told me there's a chance the, the fetus will die in surgery but if you don't have surgery, we're pretty sure you'll never walk again. Um, I did the surgery. Uh, it was a low chance, but a real one. The anesthesia was changed from general to localized. And it was hellish because um, normally they give you all these strong pain meds, but because I was pregnant, I was denied them all, except Oxycontin, which they said to take sparingly because there is a chance of maternal and fetal drug addiction. So I was like, well, I'm in agonizing pain. I also suffered burns. It's a long story. I have three broken bones, 
I have a metal brace in my leg for life, and I'm in a wheelchair. And then, long story short, heading forward, um, the baby survived the surgery. Uh, that's Layla, who maybe you heard in the background crying, sorry. <laughs> then, when I was about to give birth, I still couldn't walk, and it had to be induced because all of my prenatal checks were normal until the day before she was born. Then they said, even though I was in a wheelchair, they said, surprisingly, the fetal fetal monitoring, she's doing fine. And then that day before she was born, they said, we have to induce labor tonight or you will die. And I said, what? And they said, you have preeclampsia and your, your test results are so abnormal that if you don't, if we don't take the baby out tonight, Connie, you will die. And I was like, what? And so I got induced and Layla was born the next morning. I was still in a wheelchair and I had to wear a mask because it was COVID. And we had to find a host family to watch Isabella uh, because no babysitter would watch um, Isabella 24-7 on call because I could go into labor at any time. And Isabella at the time was three and a half. And so I gave birth that way. At, and I, it was weeks before my 44th birthday in a wheelchair with a mask on. All of that happened. And so that's my birth story. I thought it would just, it would break me. It, I would never recover. But somehow um, y- you adapt to a new normal. And that's kind of what happened. And Layla's doing great. And Isabella is getting some therapeutic supports. And she's a very bright, affectionate, hilarious, pretty little girl. So yeah. Wow. I mean, this episode has been like nonstop. Some of the craziest stories I've ever heard. And, you know, you've you've (laughs) been through it all and you're still here. So uh, we're so grateful that you're here today to share your story. Like I said, hopefully I'll see it in a K-drama soon because it's a great (laughs) storyline for sure. Um, But yeah, I really just want to thank you today, um, Connie, for being here to share your story, to share the things that you've been through. I'm sure the listeners will enjoy listening to this episode and realizing like, Anything's really possible if you just put yourself out there and never let your circumstances um, define you, right? And you're a great example of that. You know, you're still here, you're standing, you're you. you're thriving, you know, you have two beautiful children um, and you're just going out there, you know, doing amazing things. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any um, social media profiles or links they can, uh, our listeners can connect with you with? If you guys want to um, connect with me about prison work or homeless work or um, about special needs and autism. I've learned a lot the hard way. So yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And to our listeners, I just want to thank Connie for joining us today. To learn more about Connie, you can visit our website, AsianVoicesRadio.com. If you have any suggestions for future guests or topics, we'd love to hear from you. Also, be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, as well as follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Asian Voices Radio is produced by Asian Culture and Media Alliance, a nonprofit that empowers our API community with a voice through media arts. If you would like to support our program and make a donation, please visit AsianVoicesRadio.com. Thank you for listening. I'm Sheena Yapchan. Please join us next week for another exciting and thought-provoking Asian Voices Radio show. Until then, take care, everyone. Bye.